For 1923, we see an example of Bugatti's divergence. His whole life was a mixture of brilliance and then you might say brilliantly stupid things. And certainly for 1923, most of us feel that the racing car he produced for the Grand Prix, which was then at Tours in France, was really an aberration. He had always resisted the argument that coachwork was important on cars because of the weight. He argued that the loss of performance due to the weight of the body was more important than the benefit from streamlining. But he had been persuaded against his judgment, we think, to have a body put on the 22 car, which wasn't too bad. And then he decided, for reasons which we don't know, to produce an aerodynamically designed car for the 23 Grand Prix. He produced a car which was really an aerofoil section of a wing, except that it was rectangular in front view and it had a high frontal area. Now these cars had an extremely short wheelbase, shorter than the previous year, reduced from 2.4 meters down to 2 meters. And because of the type of aerofoil section, one created lift on the top surface of the wing, as it were, which tended to lift the car slightly at high speed. And because the frontal area was fairly generous, the body straddled the wheels, the total drag was in fact fairly substantial. Now this car was not a success. Road holding was poor, Although it was actually fast, it managed to do about 120 miles an hour on a timed sprint. It was certainly very difficult to handle, and it had no success at all in the race. After the race, he sold one to the Unix in Prague, and they used it for a bit and actually returned it, sent it back to the factory in exchange for the later car of the year following, because they weren't happy with it. It was extraordinary in the sense that the driver sat virtually on top of the engine and there was no bulkhead proper between the engine and the driver, something which is not permitted quite rightly today. The monitor was in the cockpit, everything was accessible more or less, but it must have been a very uncomfortable ride for the drivers. Now, after this race, something happened which made Bugatti change direction. My own opinion is, that he'd seen the Fiat's, which were successful in the 1923 race. And I think he said to himself, what my Italian friends can do, I can do better. This was a good looking car with a nice streamlined body. It had a, an interesting hollow axle, which was very light and ingenious, with the springs passing through the axle, but their axle was made in two pieces. And what I think Bugatti must have done was he must have gone home and said, I am going to do better than the Fiat. And he then sat down and designed what was to be one of the classic racing cars of all times. First of all, he improved the engine. The top half of the engine was basically the same as his production Type 30, except the compression ratio was raised. It had the two cylinder blocks and two carburetors, one feet each block, and the camshaft over the top. But now he put the Renito in the dash here, driven off the end of the camshaft. And he built this round a completely new chassis frame, where the frame was wasted at the back to follow the lines of a streamlined tail, so he could produce a body similar to that on the Fiat. The other major engine change was to introduce a roller bearing crankshaft. The limitation on his earlier engine, which had three ball bearings on the crankshaft and plain white metal begins fed by squirted oil. The weakness of that was that at high speed, there was not enough oil to cool the bearings and you would tend to run a bearing or throw a connecting rod. So he decided to do what other engine designers were doing, to fit a built-up crankshaft using roller bearings, which avoided the issue of getting adequate oil to a plane bearing, because a roller bearing doesn't generate so much heat and doesn't need anything like as much oil to cool it as a plane bearing. This was a, a brilliant piece of engineering and a good example of the best of Bugatti's design work, the crankshaft are built up in sections of really hard, case-hardened steel ground all over. 
and then the alignment of the various sections of the crankshaft to get the timing you want was done by cross cotter pins, exactly as indeed is done on a bicycle. You will understand that a bicycle, the two pedals, are kept in the correct orientation at 180 degrees by the cross cotter pins, and you can vary the angle very slightly by altering the angle of the cotter pin. Well, that's exactly what Begay did. In order to get the crank true and, and balanced properly, all you had to do, although it did take some time in the factory indeed, to alter the cotter pin angles by selecting cotter pins at different angles to get the matter perfectly in alignment. Now, the complete car had this admirably wasted frame, which enabled the tail to envelop the frame at the rear. There were two other major innovations. First of all, there was a hollow axle. The Fiat, as I had mentioned, had hollow axles, but they were cut in the middle and joined together to enable you to bore them out. Now, Bugatti went one better, and he produced an axle which was closed at the ends and hollow in the middle which is paradoxical, achieved indeed by making the axle from a forging straight, boring it right through, hammering down the ends at each end to close them, and then bending them to get the sort of S shape, and then finish polishing them all over. Meanwhile, the springs are taken through boxes in the axle. And so you get the extraordinary Bugatti paradox of a hollow axle it would close at both ends, and you have to think hard how he made it. He kept his old radiator, but now to keep the aerodynamics better, he reduced the size of the radiator, enabling the whole body to taper from the narrow point, widened as it went past the passengers, and then closed up at the tail at the end. A very handsome body. If today you look at that body, the way they've divided the panels up, it's almost impossible to suggest how you could make it better looking. It's really a, a virtually perfect example of what today we would call industrial design. Now this car appeared at the 1924 show, which was at Lyon. They managed to produce five cars, which created a sensation because they really were extremely good looking and certainly the best looking cars there. Now in the race, unfortunately, all was not well. The car had been fitted with the final modification, cast aluminium wheels with detachable rims to save a bit of weight. But unfortunately, the tires used were not properly cured. And during the race, almost all the tires they had failed. And the race was, from Bugatti's point of view, a disaster. Only car was running at the end. And he really went away very upset. Although, in fact, the performance of the car was surprisingly good and all the novel features, apart from the tyres, which weren't really novel, had been proved beyond that as to be excellent. He was very depressed about this, but his customers were faithful and rallied around him, and he managed to sell all the first batch of cars without any difficulty. One of the first ones came to England, another one went to Prague, to Elizabeth Eunuch, and he had more success, in fact, on the second outing of the car, at San Sebastian in the end of September 1924, when his car came in second in the Grand Prix there. That cheered him up, no doubt. The response from the marketplace to the visual appearance of this new car was really quite outstanding. And in the early months of 1925, he produced his replica car, which looked exactly the same as the full-blooded racing car, but had wire wheels and the engine was simplified. It didn't have a roller bearing crank. It had the touring crankshaft and bearing from the production Type 30. It was called a Tecla in France, popularly, because Tecla was the current type of replica pearls, which the older women will remember. Anyway, this little car was also an immediate success because it gave the impecunious purchaser opportunity to drive a car which looked exactly like the full-blooded Grand Prix car, but was about half the price to buy. At the end of 1925, he also produced 
a new four-cylinder engine, and this was put into two cars. He had been developing this because while the production of the Brescia had kept the factory going and the output had really gone up to over 2,000 cars, this had been paying the wages, as it were, all during the 24, 25, and 26 period. There was a need for a better model. And he produced, in the first place, this four-cylinder engine, which was what he needed to produce a small one-and-a-half-litre car. He did two things with that. First of all, he put it in the Grand Prix chassis and produced a splendid little car, which looked identical with the other eight-cylinder wire-wheeled car, the 35A. And that ceased production, and it was replaced by the Model 37, which was a splendid little four-cylinder car. Very much appreciated and sold widely all over the world because it was simple. It had a four-cylinder engine with plain bearings, not these complicated dollar bearings, and it offered, for a modest price, the young blood of the day, a splendid little sports car. The other thing he did was to produce an excellent grand sport car with a rather nice little close couple body with the same engine in a new chassis, slightly more robust than the Brescia, but on the same general lines, but with good brakes and all the qualities of steering and everything that the earlier models had. That was a splendid little car called the Type 40 and was produced for a relatively modest price. It sold for about one third of the price of the full bloody Grand Prix car and really competed with the better quality four-cylinder cars of the period, something that sold for about 350 pounds in England, something like that, which was really quite a modest price for a car of this quality. The next stage in the development was the development of improved versions of the racing car for the 26th season. Uh, he didn't in fact start doing superchargers until later, at the end of 1926. But in early 26, he produced a 2.3 litre car, initially without a supercharger. And then by the Monza Grand Prix, he'd managed to add a supercharger to the engine. To explain what he did to the engine, he put a drive on the front here up to the supercharger and put the carburetor down below and then fed up this manifold into the cylinder blocks. Well, the only modification, in fact, was the drive, the blower and a different carburetor and the manifolding. In fact, it was relatively simple to convert the engine from one to the other. But apart from that, it is really very difficult tell a supercharged car from an unsupercharged car, except that there is a little telltale hole. The expert will notice on the real car a little hole in the bonnet up here, which corresponds to the supercharged relief valve. Anyway, that car was introduced in the early part of 1927. Bugatti had a good year in 1925. He won almost everything in 1926. It was his real golden year. He won the World Championship, he won all the major Grand Prix. It was certainly his peak year in performance. He had a relatively good year in 1927, except that racing in Europe had come to a grinding halt in those days. There was a lot of arguing about the Formula Libre, as it was called, the Free Formula. Nobody could make up their mind what they wanted the racing formula to do. And there were a lot of independent races run, and there was no proper pattern in the racing in the period 1927 to 28. He produced his supercharged car, 35B, which was really the most famous of the racing Bugattis produced up to 1930, the car which everybody seems to want to have nowadays. A very beautiful machine and a very good performance. A good 35B, for example, can be taken out today on a racetrack, and it can do well over 125 miles an hour without any difficulty at all. And if you put it on alcohol fuel, it'll really exceed that. So it was a splendid car. It could do a standing kilometer. In fact, the world's record it, it held, it held it appeared in something of the order of 28 seconds, which was really quite quick for a kilometer compared with a good modern sports car. 
Well, then we come to 28, where he went along racing this car. But the real problems started by 1929. The Wall Street crash came, and the whole financial climate in Europe by the end of the 29, the beginning of 1930, was pretty disastrous. And although the production of the 35B continued, and a few were made in 1929, it tailed off in 1930, and something better was needed.